Another HBO shocker, some crazy remakes, and a lot more coming right up. Hello everybody, I'm Dan Merle, here with the first of a new show that I'm trying out. This is kind of a soft launch week here on the channel. I've got this show, I also have the streaming show, which I'm splitting off from Charts with Dan, which will be out later this week. And the reason I call it kind of a soft launch week is because I can't do this particular Monday show next week because I'm going to be traveling a little bit. But this is sort of a preview week, and this show really is sort of a look back at a week in news and look forward at the week ahead, and just a way for me to share my thoughts on stuff that I didn't do an entire video for. That doesn't mean that I won't do standalone videos for new stories in the future. It's just something new that I'm trying. So we're going to talk a little bit of HBO. We're going to talk a little bit about Disney and Warner Brothers and some trailers, the Star Wars celebration news that came out this past week. Before we get to any of that, though, I do want to please direct your attention down to the description box below. There are a couple of links there to continue to donate to Tornado Relief here in Central Arkansas. We got hit with a very bad tornado a little bit over a week ago. I was actually driving around today with my mom who'd been out of town and the damage here, it's just catastrophic. It, it carved a, a hole through my hometown, missed my mom's house by about 100 yards, hit a lot of other houses for people that I know. So please, if you have a little bit of extra money that you could donate, please donate to one of those links down in the description below. They're both local Arkansas organizations and all of that money is going towards tornado relief. So thank you so much and stay tuned for more here on the channel about that in the future. But let's turn to our first story, which is a big spoiler. So if you have not watched last night's episode of Succession on HBO, and you are a Succession fan, and you haven't heard anything about last night's episode, then go no further, because there are some big spoilers ahead. One of the biggest shockers that has happened on any HBO show in quite some time, I think. So if you want to avoid any of that, then stop right here, because I'm going to be going ahead with this Succession story right now. You know, I did not watch season one of Game of Thrones as it was airing. I watched it back later, I think, when season two was on. What happened last night on Succession, to me, it approximated what people must have felt when they killed Ned Stark off. And you're like, well, wait a minute. What are you going to do next? That's the main character. Because if you've seen Succession or you don't really care, this was a monumental event because last night saw the very unexpected death of Logan Roy, played by Brian Cox. You, you think he's basically the main character or amongst the main characters of the show. Everything seems to be building up to this big finale face-off. Who's going to win him or his kids? Control over the Empire. He's flying out to seal this business deal. And then he just dies on the airplane. And you don't even see it happen. So I want to break down a little bit into that episode. I think it's one of the best episodes of television ever made. And what I love about that approach, which is that you see everything, or you get all this information from the point of view of his kids. Is he okay at all? He's not okay. No. I mean, they say his heart has stopped and his breathing has stopped. The fact that you don't see this figure, Logan Roy, has been the center of the show from the very beginning, and you get it all through a phone call. And I think what I love about that is it's so relatable in that there are so many of us where you get that sort of news completely unexpectedly on a day that didn't seem any different from any other day where you're not even thinking about it, and literally it just drives a freight train through your life. I've gotten that call before where I wake up in the morning, I pick up the phone like it was any other day, and then everything about my life changes in an instant. And watching this unfold, and really the actors that are on this show, Kieran Culkin, Jeremy Strong, Sarah Snook, the three of them really at the center of this episode, the core of this episode, Alan Ruck though also coming in as like a sneaky MVP this season. He never even liked me. Hey, come. hey you, sorry, you know what, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I don't even know what I mean. And we're experiencing it, and that's the other brilliant thing, is they basically are having the viewer simulate the experience that the characters are going through. Because Mara and I were watching it on the couch, and at first, they get this phone call, and it's Tom who's saying, like, oh, your father's really sick. Something's happened to him on the plane. And we're like, okay, here we go. Another one of those Logan Roy head games. Ser no, serious it, what? It, it's, it is 
is very, very bad. It, it seems very bad. I'm so sorry to call you like this. And then he's like, yeah, they're doing chest compressions, and I, we don't know if he's alive or not. And it's like, oh, man, but what, what what's he up to now? Like, what kind of power play is this? And he's like, well, I'm going to hand the phone off. And then they hand the phone off to somebody else, and they're like, yeah, no, this is really bad. And it's like, well, I mean, they're bringing somebody else in. Like, this is really messed up. They, they should talk ahead, to him. They should speak to him. Is that yeah. right? What did he say? And then you see, like, in the deep background, somebody doing chest compressions, and you're like, okay, well, this is kind of far to go for a practical joke. And then you see that this is not a practical joke, that they are doing chest compressions, that Logan Roy is laying in the aisle of this airplane, lifeless, and then he's just dead. I think he went. I think he's gone. Okay. And I love this conversation where everyone's saying he's dead. Kieran Culkin, who plays Roman, uh, had such a great part to play where he's like, why does everyone keep saying that? Nobody's nobody's seen him. A doctor hasn't seen him. I feel like he was playing the part of the viewer. What's the point of keep on saying it? All I'm saying, I'm not being crazy. I'm saying a fact. I'm saying we don't know. And until we do know, it's not a very nice thing to say, is it? That's certainly what I was thinking when I was watching on the couch. They're like, well, they keep saying he's dead. We don't know that he's dead. They haven't shown us a body. They haven't shown us anybody declaring that he's dead. Why does everyone keep saying that he's dead? It really was such a brilliant way to write this episode and put us in the shoes of these different characters. And then just narratively, I mean, first of all, the guts to kill off basically your main character off screen. And suddenly, in an episode where nobody was expecting it, but also when you look back on everything and what they've been setting up this season so far, and the premise of the show. I mean, the show is called Succession. It's going to be about who succeeds their father. That's what the show has been about from the very first episode. And it makes complete sense that the last majority of episodes for the final season are going to be the end game of Succession. And in order to succeed their father, their father has to be gone. It really was such a brilliantly written, brilliantly acted, executed episode. I love the show so much. And now, really, these last seven episodes that are left in the season, you don't know what to expect because it's not yet another face-off between Logan and the kids and one-upsmanship and gamesmanship and legal maneuvering. Now, all bets are off. So if you aren't watching Succession, well, I guess I just spoiled like the biggest reveal of the whole show, but that doesn't ruin the show because it is a great show. But if you are a Succession watcher, let me know down in the comments below what you thought of the handling of Logan Roy's death, where we're going to go from here, because I thought it was just an incredible turn and a fantastic way to handle that. And oh, sometimes when you're watching greatness, you just know it. There were episodes, uh, Ozymandias from Breaking Bad. That was a show I was watching week to week. Watching that episode, you understand that you're watching one of the great episodes of television ever produced. I got that feeling last night where I'm just like, this is unlike any other episode of television that I've seen before. Emmys, give it, just line them up. Just, just line everybody up. Give them, a, give them a trophy. Just give them the statues. So good. So anyway, Succession I had to talk about because that was the talk of the our house certainly last night. And I think the couple million people that are watching Succession also, we'll be talking about that. So if you hear that water cooler buzz, check it out because it is a really great show. And I think there's still lots of twists and turns left to go. I think until then, for the markets, we need to be in control. So let's talk about now a few news stories from the past week. And one that I wanted to address, I, I thought I was going to do a standalone video, but I was doing some other things last week that kind of kept me away from the channel a little bit is the story that kept breaking, or stories, I should say, that kept breaking about various remakes that studios have been deciding to do. And the first one that broke was something that came out during the Disney Investors Call last week, which is that Moana, which was a great movie that came out about mm, seven years ago, is apparently now getting a live action... Well, it's interesting, because Dwayne Johnson, who of course is the face of it, because Dwayne Johnson is the face for all projects that in some way involve Dwayne Johnson... He announced that they're doing this Moana. He called it a reimagining of the story and then went on to list like 15 things that were in the animated film. Moana, Grandma Tala, the music, the dance, Tafiti, Pua the Pig, the village. Hey, hey's gonna be in it, but of course Maui will be in it too. So this is pretty much a live action remake of an animated film that came out less than 10 years ago, which I knew that Disney was going crazy with these live action remakes, but this is a whole other level. Like the kids that saw Moana 
are still kids. They're, they haven't even jumped from different parts of grade school, barely. And yet now you're doing this live action remake of a barely old enough cartoon. It's, I think it's insanity, quite frankly. And then as if to one up that news, there was reporting, I think a day or two later, first from Bloomberg and then Deadline was able to confirm some parts of this story that Warner is looking to remake the Harry Potter series, that they're not going to be doing them as movies, that they're basically going to do a Harry Potter live action streaming series, and that each season of the series will focus on one book from the Harry Potter series. So one season will be Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, one season will be Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, Secrets, etc. J.K. Rowling is apparently in talks to produce, which is the last major hurdle for this series to get the green light. And this seems even crazier to me because the movies just wrapped up, what, 10 years ago? And those were like, even more so than Moana, like generationally defining movies. I mean, yes, the first one is about 20 years old, but you're not just remaking one movie. You're going to remake all of them. That was one of the most perfectly cast series of movies ever. You're telling me you're going to find a better Snape than Alan Rickman? You're going to find a better Harry Potter than Daniel Radcliffe and a better Ron and Hermione, etc.? Like, you've got to give these things time, and it just feels so creatively bankrupt. But that's what people are going for, and I think that's what we're seeing in this era where the studios are becoming parts of bigger and bigger companies and the entertainment divisions are becoming more and more integral to the workings of these studios, they are completely risk averse. I mean, Warner has said that they're going to be making Lord of the Rings films and they're going to, you know, remix and give us a Gandalf and an Aragorn and whatever movie. It's not about innovation anymore. It's about regurgitation and how much of what you already liked are we going to serve back to you because those studios see no risk in that. They just see money. But that's not necessarily how that always works. Because when you look at the newer installments in the franchise films that have really worked, and I mean have generated hundreds of millions of dollars in profits and billions at the box office, a lot of them, and I'd say most of them, ones like Star Wars The Force Awakens, Spider-Man No Way Home, it is the familiar, but there's this air of mystery around it. What's going to happen? How are they going to handle it? How is it going to be incorporated? What do these new characters have to do with it? There are questions that the audience has. And even with some of these remakes, I think when you're doing Beauty and the Beast or Aladdin, it is still, well, what's the translation going to be like? How is this person going to do in the role? If The Rock is playing Maui in the live action remake of Moana, then I know how Maui is going to be because it's the same actor that just did the same role less than 10 years ago. There's no mystery in that. And I think that that's really a fundamental misunderstanding that studios have. They think they can just serve the familiar up to the audiences and they'll lap it up. But if there's no mystery to it, then it's been proven that nobody really cares. Example number one, Solo, a Star Wars story. They basically said, well, people love Han Solo. We'll just give them a Han Solo movie and we'll give them everything that they love about Han Solo. We'll give them Lando and Han and the Millennium Falcon and the Kessel Run. And audiences are just like, eh. I don't really care because there was no mystery there. They knew Han Solo. They know what's going to happen with that character. They didn't care about any sort of new untold adventure because they didn't sell what's the hook? Why should you show up? And it's only gotten worse in the years since. I think that there are definitely some things that Warner could do with the Harry Potter franchise that would get people excited. People have been asking for a flashback series set at Hogwarts with Harry's parents and young Snape, etc. Uh, the Marauders. Water series basically for like ever for like 20 years since Prisoner of Azkaban and yet they're not doing that they're just going back to the same old source material listen I love Spew. Everybody wants to see Hermione uh, fighting for the rights of house elves. And yes, people were upset that that was cut from the movie adaptations, but do we really need an entire retelling of that story from the beginning uh, just to include things like that or little bits of details or character work? And how many people really are you pleasing by including those things? So I'm very skeptical of the Harry Potter thing and I'm very skeptical of the Moana thing because I don't see the mystery there. What's new? Why should I care? What's going to make other people care, and I think this is something that studios have to figure out. Yes, they're going to be repackaging and selling nostalgia to us. Look at what Super Mario Brothers has just been doing, but that's the first time we're seeing that animated Super Mario universe on screen, and I think that there was curiosity there. 
Those films now are going to have to work to surprise audiences. The studios can't just phone it in anymore. They have to put some effort behind these things. And I see very low effort from Disney. And I see very low effort from Warner Brothers on both of these projects. And I think you're going to need to see a lot more effort on everybody's part in order to really start paying dividends. Because really, that's what these studios care about. There's a lot more news to get to, but before we do, I'm going to thank the sponsor for this video, Stamps.com. And you know, everybody needs a team to achieve anything. I know that Mara is an invaluable part of my team, and she actually does handle a lot of sending stuff out when I need it. With Stamps.com, a post office is in your office. All you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a scale so that you'll have everything you need to get started. And if you need a package picked up, you can easily schedule it through Stamps.com. If you sell products online, it also seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Running a business isn't cheap, especially when it comes to fulfilling orders for customers. Luckily, Stamps.com has huge carrier discounts, including up to 84% off USPS and UPS rates, and it automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options. Stamps.com has been an indispensable partner for over 1 million business for over two decades, and you can get access to the USPS and UPS services you need right from your computer anytime, day or night, no lines, no traffic, traffic, and no waiting. Set your business up for success when you get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code MERL, that's M-U-R-R-E-L-L, for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code MERL. Speaking of Star Wars and new projects, Star Wars Celebration happened in London this past weekend, and we got, as expected, some big Star Wars news. The biggest being that there are now three Star Wars movies that are in the works, and none of them are the ones that Lucasfilm has already announced. One of them is from James Mangold, who's directing a movie about the dawn of the Jedi, basically the first people to wield the Force, set thousands of years before the Star Wars movies that we know. Dave Filoni's doing a movie that sort of wraps up his shows Book of Boba Fett, Mandalorian, Ahsoka, Rebels, Clone Wars in the era of the New Republic, so sort of tying all of that together in one epic movie. And then we have a movie from Charmaine Obeid Shinoy, who worked on Ms. Marvel and some other Disney projects. She will be directing Daisy Ridley, who's returning in the role of Rey, establishing a new Jedi Academy. And kind of in the vein of what we were just talking about, it seems like at first glance that maybe Dave Filoni's movie is on the most solid ground because it is the most familiar, but it really depends on the angle that he's going to take with that. The more risky stuff is, of course, the stuff that we don't know anything about, which is James Mangold's movie and even the Daisy Ridley Ray movie. I know that a lot of Star Wars fans love Ray and they love Daisy Ridley, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to show up for a movie just about her character when they don't really know what the story is that they're telling. So they're going to have to do a lot of work selling the audience on both of those movies because they can't rely on the old familiar stuff really. The wind is out of the sails as far as announcing Star Wars movies. When you announce five, six, seven, eight of them that don't happen, then it gets a little harder to be excited by the ones that you are announcing, even if it's the big splashy announcement at something like Star Wars Celebration. So I think amongst the fan base, it's a little harder to get them excited because you announce these movies and everybody goes like, okay, sure, but is it really going to happen? And then I think that you really have to restart the momentum in the mainstream movie-going crowd. And we're talking about movies, not just streaming shows, with Star Wars films. Because you had great momentum with The Force Awakens, and that carried over into The Last Jedi. And then there was some pop around the introduction of Grogu and The Mandalorian Season 1. But Star Wars is kind of a cold franchise. I mean, you're basically starting the engines up from nothing. And I think that Star Wars has made some pretty big mistakes over the years. And one of the first things that is I think they've really, and this goes for Disney as a whole, have over-invested their strategy in social media uh, in particular. Like The Last Jedi, I really do think that the response to The Last Jedi uh, spooked them. 
And I think that that was evident in what we saw with The Rise of Skywalker. And The Last Jedi actually did pretty well at the box office. And the cinema score amongst the average audience goer that was going on opening night was pretty strong. But I think that Disney read what all the hardcore people were saying and Ryan Johnson tweeting at the people, etc. And they said, oh, God, the fan base hates it. What do we do? And then they did The Rise of Skywalker, which lost even more people. And really just kind of uh, that whole trilogy, I think, went out like kind of a wet fart because it really seemed like nobody knew what they were doing. I also think that it oversold Disney on things like a Han Solo movie. People were saying like, oh, Donald Glover is Lando. Twitter loves it. And then nobody shows up to see Donald Glover as Lando. Or a Boba Fett show. You know, Boba Fett shows up at social media saying like, we love Boba Fett. He's awesome. And then the Boba Fett show comes out. They make it. They obviously didn't have a good idea for it. And that show doesn't do really well. I think that Disney is paying too much attention to social media, which is partially reflective of what people think, but it is a funhouse mirror reflection, and I've said that before. It is definitely not a one-to-one -one reflection of the real world, and I think it's only getting worse. For example, there was a story that came out last week from Alan Menken, who was saying that they are changing some lyrics in the new Little Mermaid thing to make it seem like Kiss the Girl isn't Eric uh, kissing Ariel without her consent, and they're changing some words to Poor Unfortunate Souls, so it doesn't sound like Ursula is saying that women shouldn't talk. Both of those songs are songs about about characters in the movie trying to influence or persuade other characters in the film to do things. Kiss the Girl is about Sebastian and everybody serenading Eric, saying, yeah, kiss her, kiss her, because if they kiss, then everything's fine. And Ursula is tricking Ariel when she's saying poor unfortunate souls and saying, you don't need a voice anyway. They don't like it when women talk up there. It's not literally the movie saying women shouldn't talk. And yet it seems like, if this is to be believed from Alan Menken, and I think that he's a pretty trustworthy source, Disney is like proactively changing this because they're afraid of what the response is going to be on social media because listen if they didn't change those lyrics would some people have said something about it on twitter or wherever else i don't know if twitter's still going to be working when little mermaid comes out but would some people have said some stuff online about it yes of course they would have but that doesn't make them right because when the movie actually comes out i think the average person understands what the intention or the purpose of the song is it's the small minority who have a huge voice on social media that either willfully misunderstand or completely miss the point of it, and they say things because it gets clicks and likes and everything else, and it's a narrative on social media, whatever. Disney has got to stop running away from these things, and it has really infiltrated their strategy on everything. So I hope with this new Star Wars stuff, they're kind of hitting the reset button, and they're saying, listen, we're not going to listen to what social media wants. We're not going to listen to what, you know, it seems like we think the fans think is popular or not popular. We're going to go with what our creatives want to do. If one of our creatives makes a decision, we're going to trust them and we're going to back that decision and we're not going to change things or try to alter things or worry about, oh, I don't know, is Solo going to be too funny? Should we get rid of Lord Miller, who went on to make Into the Spider-Verse, like one of the best superhero movies ever? I still want to see what their version of Solo should have been. And again, I think that Disney got spooked by what they thought fans might think of the tonal shift of a Han Solo story might be and perhaps cost themselves a great movie. I don't know, maybe it was a disaster. We'll never know. The basic point of this entire rant is that I'm glad that they finally at Lucasfilm seem to have some sort of strategy with these Star Wars films. I hope they stick to this strategy and they don't, you know, cancel this film or Daisy Ridley drops out in six months and we're back at zero. Let's start building the new generation of Star Wars movies. Yes, including pieces of the past and respectful of the past, but also incorporating the future because that's what all of these franchises need. And it goes back to the remakes and everything else we've been talking about. It's not just about the past, it's about the future. At some point you have to start building one because there's only so much past before you completely run out and you become bankrupt. So in addition to the Star Wars stuff, there was a couple trailers that also came out last week that I'll mention briefly. One of them was a new trailer for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, which really wasn't that much different from the last trailer that we got. I wonder what's going on with this film. I know that there are people out there that purport to have leaks, etc., and I don't really read that because if they're wrong, it's a waste of time, and if they're right, I've just spoiled the movie for myself, and I don't really want to do either of those things. But I do find it interesting that like the action scenes that were featured in the first Indiana Jones trailer were pretty much the exact same ones that were featured in this Indiana Jones trailer, which to me says that there's a big chunk of this movie 
that we're not even seeing snippets of. Like, it really it seems like we've only seen snippets of like six or seven different individual scenes in the film or sequences in the film. And there's obviously a lot more that's going to happen in the movie. So th there's definitely something like, I'm kind of looking around the edges of this trailer saying like, there's something behind the other, there's something back there. They're, 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 they're working some kind of magic back there, and I'm curious to see what that is, because there really wasn't a whole lot of new revelation for me in this new Indiana Jones trailer, but hey, listen, I like going into a movie not knowing what to expect, so we'll see what happens with that. Speaking of a movie where I don't quite know what to expect, uh, Barbie also introduced its second trailer, which is really the first look at the actual film, and I still couldn't tell you what this film is. I don't know what Barbie is. I don't know what it is. I It, it is a lot of Barbies and a lot of Kens. And I think that what we saw in this trailer was mostly from the beginning part where we're in Barbie land and it's all Barbies and Kens. And then it looks like they're going to go into our world or like the re quote unquote real world. Uh, but I still don't quite know what the vibe on this movie is. I think it's interesting. It's already launching memes. I mean, I've seen so many Barbie memes and people putting their face and saying like, I am a Barbie with a little text thing. And you know, it's, it's fun. It's, so it's, it's, it's a way for people to spend their time. But this movie, I mean, it's obvious that there's a, a lot of jokes about Ken being dumb, which, let's be honest, Ken is kind of dumb. But I hope that's not the only joke, because, like, Toy Story was doing Ken is dumb jokes, like, 10 years ago. I hope they have a little bit more to add than just Ken is dumb. Um, and, you know, Margot Robbie, uh, this looks interesting. I don't know. This could be, like, one of the best movies of the year or, like, one of the most catastrophic, mystifying ones. But I find that exciting, personally. Like I said, I don't want to walk into a movie knowing exactly exactly what it's going to be beginning to end and Barbie still remains one of the big mysteries of 2023 for me that trailer didn't do a whole lot to clear that up did you bring your rollerblades I literally go nowhere without them. So that pretty much wraps up this collection of stories for Monday. Like I said, it's a bit of a soft launch week. Let me know down in the comments below what you liked, what you didn't like from this format. One thing I would like to do is add some interaction here. So a way for you to ask me questions or viewer questions that I could do here on the show. Uh, so if you have any ideas, whether it's a hashtag, whatever, let me know down there as well as just general feedback because I like to hear what you think. It may not stick on this day or to this exact format, like I said, I'm just kind of trying a few different things because I want to formalize some things here on the channel, maybe set more of a predictable schedule, uh, but I also don't want to be absolutely rigid in my choices initially, um, phrasing. Anyway, you know, I can't do this particular show next week because I'll be traveling back uh, from a trip out of town, but there is a lot happening on the channel this week. First of all, I'll have Charts with Dan tomorrow. We're going to talk about Super Mario Brothers. It had a massive opening weekend, um, one of the best openings ever, the best five-day opening weekend in box office history, although that's a pretty short list. That's one of those records that sounds great, uh, but isn't quite as impressive, uh, but also like a really great animated opening, a great PG opening, the, the biggest opening of the year worldwide and domestically. So we're going to talk about that. I'm also, as I mentioned, splitting the streaming charts off into their own show, which will probably be on Wednesday, so you can see what's happening on Netflix, the Nielsen ratings, etc. And then I've got reviews coming out for a couple of films later this week, as I can do them while I'm on the road. And then over the next few weeks, I'm going to be tweaking uh, the formulas of shows and trying to set some schedules and, of course, taking your suggestions. So thank you so much for tuning in as I talked about some of the news stories over this past week that I enjoyed. Let me know your thoughts down into the comments below. Until then, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.